the uh, 2018 Emirates Australian Open, our first of several press conferences, and we've uh, got out the big guns very early here. Um, Chief Executive Officer of Golf Australia, Stephen Pitt, uh, he's going to give a sort of a state of the nation address of the of the Open, and uh, then field your questions if should you have any. Um, Stephen, welcome, and go for your life. Uh, well, thank you, Mark, and welcome everyone today. It's always a big week this week. Um, and there's always a mixture of uh, trepidation and excitement as we head into the tournament. Um, but we are that overwhelmingly we're excited about the 104th edition of the Australian Open and we're expecting a really great week. Uh, and we're pleased with the way things have come together. So firstly, I'd like to thank our commercial partners, Lagged Air Sports. Uh, they do a range of things for the tournament, but probably uh, one of the main ones is they assemble the field. And I think this year they've done an excellent job in what's been a pretty challenging year, I think it's well documented uh, the changes that have come about this season. But I think they've been able to assemble a field that has great depth. I think really importantly, we've got a number of informed players, players that have won on the US tour as recently as yesterday. Um, and we've also got players, I think, that Australian audiences won't have seen a lot of. And uh, I think they'll engage really well with them. So from that perspective, uh, we're excited about uh, the week. I think something we're really, really proud of and um, looking forward to is the All Abilities Championship. And it's the first time uh, that we've held this. Uh, it's, it's really important to us. Uh, we've got 12 of the best AWD players from around the world uh, and they will be in the, the main field from Friday through Sunday. There'll be groupings uh, who'll be in the TV slots uh, on the weekend. And that's something we think is really important for Australian sport, Australian golf, and it's actually something we think our crowds will love. Uh, these, these players are fan fantastic players, and I think they'll add a new dimension to the tournament that will become more important as time goes by. Uh, we're doing this in conjunction uh, with ISPS Handa, who's a really important partner with Golf Australia, so it's something we're really uh, excited to see roll out during the week. Uh, this week, of course, uh, commences a really big three weeks for Australian golf. Uh, we've, we've had some, some great lead-in events, you know, via state opens and other events, but uh, the Australian Open kicks off a really important week, uh, three-week swing for, for golf. Uh, we've, of course, got the World Cup next week and then the PGA uh, the week after. So we've got a raft of great players playing in Australia this summer. Uh, and a big part of, of this for us is to, and also the PGA, is to showcase the game of golf and to, to make golf stronger and get people more attracted to playing. So uh, we're really excited about the next three weeks as they unfold. In terms of where uh, the tournament is at, um, we're really pleased with where it is commercially and the revenue streams of the tournament. And I think for people that were here in, in 2012, which was the last time we are at the Lakes, uh, the corporate areas are, are pretty much double in size, so we're certainly heading in the right direction. We've added some really important commercial partners this year. Uh, so there's an underlying health, I think, of the tournament that augurs well for the future. And obviously, we've had a very strong, stable and secure relationship with New South Wales government, and I think that's been a driving force behind the growth of the tournament. Um, in terms of... The future, you know, we are really optimistic and uh, buoyant about the future of the tournament, the future of Golf Australia and, and golf in this country. Uh, and look, as part of that, we're really pleased to announce today that the Australian Open next year will be held uh, from the 5th uh, to the 8th of December, which of course is the week before President's Cup. And I think that's a really important announcement to make. That was, uh, I, I think, a critical moment in 2011 in terms of... Uh, the Australian Open being before President's Cup, and I think we, we were able to leverage that really well. We had a star-studded field that year, and we're really confident of being able to do the same uh, in 2019. And I, and I need to thank our, uh, our friends at the PGA who've made this decision. It's an important decision. Uh, it's, it's the right decision for golf, but I, I applaud them for making that decision. Uh, I think for their, uh, for their care of our national championship, and also, for the close relationship we've forged. I think that's absolutely critical for the future of Australian golf. So I thank them for that, um, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Uh, that particular date you just announced, that put, us, put the Australian Open up against Tigers event? Yes, it will. Um, we, we understand that. I guess last time around with the Australian Open, I think we got nine out of the 12 uh, US players. I think this time around, the, the 
thought is we'll probably that'll flip and we'll be targeting international players. And look, not everyone will play Tigers event. It's obviously a limited field, but I think look, that's the challenge that organisations like ours face in terms of dates these days. Just to follow up to that, was there any um, consultation with the PGA Tour in relative to the date for the President's Cup relative to Tigers event so that you were in a better position to get American players down here? No, I think, Brendan, the order was they picked President's Cup date and then everything worked around that. So, look, it's, it's challenging. World golf is a... It's a bit of a behemoth and there's a lot of things going on around the world at any one time. You only need to look at this Tiger Phil uh, next weekend. So there's, there's things happening at every time and you've just got to work the best you can around dates, not just around golf, but also around Australian domestic events as well. Were you cheering home Matt Kutcher over the weekend? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, we were cheering home Brant Snedeker a few weeks back too in the office and he didn't quite get it done. but. Uh, yeah, that, look, that was a great, a great win, uh, and I think he'll come here obviously playing well, full of confidence, but uh, he's one player I'm really excited to see. I've seen Matt Kuchar play uh, overseas, and the reaction he gets from crowds and uh, his sort of persona and, and uh, the feeling he gives off is really positive, so I think Australian crowds will enjoy watching him this week. Obviously, we spoke about the, the big three um, during the week. Does this uh, schedule for next year help or hinder that, getting them here for next year? Oh, look, I think it'll help um, because we, we would expect that uh, there'll be a raft of Australian players in President's Cup team, that they'll be down and will have made arrangements uh, to be down for an extended period. There's been some discussions you know, with Ernie Ells through Lagardere Sports, so you know, I think our, we're pretty confident that we'll get um, a really strong field uh, off the back of President's Cup. Patrick. Uh, Stephen, um, you say it's an exciting build-up, it's an exciting week, but I would, have, I would suggest to you that it's rather bland field and there's nothing really to excite the person out there who gets to see all these golfers on television anyway um, to suggest that Matt Kuchar is a crowd favourite seems to be stretching it a little bit in the sense that I don't think Matt Kuchar is quite bozo the clown in entertainment. Oh, well, Patrick, I, I take a different view. And I, I, well, I've spoken to a lot of golf people and I think there's a lot of positivity about the field. Um, I think it may be the deepest field we've had since uh, 2011. It's, not, it's different from a field we've had in the past. Typically we've had sort of one or two of those really big name top ten players. Uh, this year has been a challenging year, um, uh, but I, I do think it's a deep and interesting field with a lot of players in really good form. Where's it deep other than in numbers? Well, I think depth is around uh, players who are playing very, very well and are in a good position to win the tournament that have uh, you know, good CVs. We've got five of the top 50 in the world, uh, which is, uh, I think, a really a good achievement. Um, so I, I think it is a deep field. Stephen, you said in the past you've had one or two of the top players. Middle of this year you said that was still the strategy going forward. What's happened then for this tournament? Has, it, has things fallen through or is it a different approach that has changed since July when you made those comments? Look, I think the thing we've found this year is Dubai has... We're up against Dubai. And as soon as you're up against Dubai, it, it creates challenges. So there's... There's some really good players who I think you know, might have been targets who are playing in Dubai. So that cuts off a lot of um, really big names. We understand that. And I think also we're going through, there's just been some things that have happened. Everyone knows that Jason and his wife Ellie have had a baby and, uh, uh, and that's, that's terrific news. But it um, means that Jason's not here. Um, Adam's not playing in Australia this year. And of course Mark... Uh, is playing two weeks in a row and that's, that's his limit. So we understand that. I think for us, and we obviously are really exposed to it, but we see the younger players coming through. So for us, we're getting to a point in Australian golf where there is a passing of the baton. And players like Cam Smith and even Cam Davis, who won last year, uh, has, they've both had terrific years and I think we, we see a, a time when that baton will be passed to the new brigade. Um, we've got five amateurs in the field 
this week, and they're all ranked in the top 20 amateur rankings in the world. So there's a lot of positivity um, there from, from previous years. But then going back to when you made those comments, was that still in the, a chance for this year to get a couple of the top players you thought, or were you just more generally talking about the tournament going forward? Look, that's been our ongoing strategy probably since about 2011, uh, and we've been remarkably successful in that. We, you know, if you think about who's cycled through the Australian Open since then, we've had Tiger Woods, uh, Jordan Spieth, Rory McIlroy, you know, multiple years for both of those guys, Bubba Watson, Dustin Johnson, uh, Billy Haas, Nick Watney. There's been a whole raft of, of top players. Um, so we've been, I think, really successful in terms of that. This year presented different challenges uh, and we've, we've gone about it a different way. Stephen, what do you make of uh, Marcus Fraser's comments this morning, I, suggesting I, no prize money next year for the Australian Open? I, I haven't seen them yet. Well, he did say, you know, be to mix it up, maybe in a bit to potentially get some of the biggest players playing for the Stonehaven Cup, the prestige of the tournament and promoting Australia as a destination. Uh, and, and drop prize money, is it? He said it, not me. <laughs> prize money or appearance money? Prize money. OK. Um, I, I probably don't have enough context there to, to answer. Um, look, we do know we've got a very important trophy in terms of the Stonehaven Cup, uh, and we run a tournament that we try to make as attractive to, to players, particularly international players, as possible. Um, I think we've had outstanding fields uh, in the last you know, eight or nine years, and uh, you know, we're confident about the future. I, I've, I've been at Golf Australia about 10 years and I've seen the tournament grow and when I started, and I don't take any credit for this because we've had a, a very strong and positive relationship with World Sport Group and Lagardere, but uh, the tournament uh, was in pretty dire shape uh, 10 years ago and, and the trajectory has been really, really impressive since then. We've built and built and built. I think financially we're in a, a really good position and that ena enables you to do more in terms of players and, and fan experience and I think the other thing that uh, that golf will need to do in the future is is brighten up the, the broadcast of the game uh, and look at ways we can innovate there. So, Steve, David. Stephen, are you concerned about the size of the galleries that you may receive and you just mentioned broadcasting and how that may look on TV and what have you done to ensure that you do attract decent galleries? Pricing, you know, ent admission prices, etc. Uh, no, we're not concerned about galleries. Our galleries have been strong for a period of time. Um, so, and we expect to have good galleries this week. The forecast, the weather forecast is better than what it was a couple of days ago. So we're expecting to have really good crowds uh, again. Uh, and pricing is something that we do keep uh, very affordable. We want to make sure that the Australian Open is accessible to, to fans, so we've always done that. I think where we'll head to uh, in the future is I think we need to do more around the fan experience uh, and build maybe more activities for families and things like that. Brendan. Stephen, some of the feedback we get at the magazine is that the Australian Open has become Sydney-centric and the fact that what, we received a letter this month from a gentleman in Western Australia who's 40 years old and has never seen the Australian Open. He's had access to other tournaments, but in his lifetime he's never been able to go to the Australian Open unless he forks out $1,500 to come to Sydney to watch the Australian Open. What do you say to fans who are a high priority of Golf Australia um, that will currently if they live in Sydney or in Melbourne for the two years that'll be going there, what do you say to them in relation to getting to see the Australian Open? Yeah, look, I think in an ideal world, you'd like to move the tournament around the country, a la the Open Championship in Brit Britain and the US Open. Uh, but for Australian tournaments, the relationship and partnership with state governments is critical. Uh, and often that means um, stability in terms of where, where it's held. Uh, I think uh, for us, you know, we are in uh, Melbourne in 2020 and 2022, uh, and there's some a nice thought to actually be sharing it 
uh, around the country. But look, it's one of the trade-offs you have to make. Um, and I think for us, the trade-off has been that we've seen the tournament grow and we've had a really strong, stable relationship with New South Wales go government. It's important to the event. Patrick. Uh, Steve, in a period where every golf, uh, every sport recognises that it's in a marketplace of entertainment, has Golf Australia and the Australian Open as part of its problem being that it's treading water when it comes to a form of entertainment? I, I think that's a great challenge for, for golf in general, Patrick. I, I, and I do personally think golf's got to look at how it can change because we've been ultra consistent in terms of format for tournaments over a period of time. Uh, I don't think we've done a good enough job of bringing players into the living rooms uh, in Australian households over time. And I, I think other sports have probably done a better job than us. So I do think uh, golf has to change, but I don't just think it's the Australian Open or Australian tournaments. I think golf needs to have a look at, at uh, the broadcast generally and look at how it's engaging with people. Society's changing. Uh, people don't have the same time or even the same attention span that they had in the past. So I think golf's got to adapt to that. And I think we're on a journey there and uh, there's, there's some way to go. Any more questions? Yes, yeah, Stephen, um, you mentioned Adam Scott before. Just can you tell me the, the exact reasons why he decided to pass on the Australian Summer this year? I find it weird when I read this morning that I think he's actually in town today for a charity luncheon, which seems a bit odd. Um, yeah, I don't want to put words into Adam's mouth, um, and I think it's been documented about why he's not playing in Australia this year, but he's taking time off. People think, well, if he's in Australia, he should play, but the reality for Adam, if he's going to play, he's going to be practising and grinding and doing everything he needs to do, and he wants the time off. I think for him, the decision was if he played World Cup, he would play in Australia and, and do it well. Uh, if he didn't play World Cup, he wouldn't, and he'd uh, take a break and focus on getting a quick start next year. And I, th I think that's understandable. All sports people need a break at a certain time, and, and Adam's been a, a wonderful supporter of Australian golf. I think it's, you know, again, it's well documented he's played 17 of the last 18 summers in Australia. Any more questions? Yeah, BJ, no worries. Just to follow up to what I was saying before with the tournament going around the country, has it ever been considered, rather than taking the tournament around the country, to taking the Stonehaven Cup around the country to give people an idea of what is actually being played for? Um, look, it's not... Like they do with the Melbourne Cup. Yeah, it's not something we've done before, but it is a, a good idea, uh, something that we'll follow up on. But what I would say is, although the Australian Open hasn't been around the country. We have seen tournaments around the country. There's been a bit of a spread, which I think has been good. You've had PGA in, in Queensland, uh, obviously the Perth Super Sixes in, in Perth. Um, Melbourne's had its fair share through different things and World Cup, President's Cup, uh, and Adelaide's had uh, Women's Open. So there's, there's been a good spread around the country of tournaments. Um, it's just they've become harder to move than what they were. But none so. of those tournaments have 104 years of history or Jack Nicholas, Arnold Palmer, Greg Norman on the trophy? No, look, you know, we understand the Australian Open is I mean, it's unique. It's the premium event. It is, but, but look, for the reasons I, I talked about, it's, it's hard to move. Mm. Um, and that's been the reality of, of tournament life in Australia, um, that state government partnerships are absolutely critical to the health of the, the tournaments. And ultimately, you need to make sure the tournaments are, vi are financially viable and healthy before you can start to do some of those things. But we have thought about the future of what that could look like and how we could actually do that. And there are some, some ideas that there's some water to go under that bridge because we are contracted in New South Wales till 2023. But we have put a lot of thought into what it could look like and, and how we could have a different reality. Would that, would that involve shorter term contracts with state governments? Yeah, look, that's an option. Or the other option is um, trying to have an anchor type tenancy and then that may be spanning 20 years but having <coughs> out years uh, within that agreement which is something we this is the current agreement that we've we brokered this time around we we broke it in two out years uh, and we've been able to exercise them which I'm really pleased about because uh, 
Uh, when we did the deal, it was always going to be challenging to actually get that done, but we've managed to do it. So we, we've got you know two years sort of in the next five um, in Melbourne, and that's that's really positive. So ideally, you would have, say, for example, and this is purely hypothetical, uh, New South Wales government sponsoring every five years, and then in between you'd be going elsewhere. Yeah, look, there's a couple of different options that can help deliver it, and it's it's not easy to do. So there's got to be a lot of work uh, between now and then, and it, it's it's in some ways it's premature to be talking about it because we've got a, a really strong agreement with New South Wales. Um, but we will be exploring every opportunity in the future in terms of how we structure it. Uh, and it's something we, we recognise the value of moving it around and if we can make it work financially um, and keep a strong relationship with, with government, well then that's something we'll, we'll absolutely do. Because you'd agree, I mean, at the end of the day the Australian Open is essentially owned by the golfers of Australia, not just the golfers in Sydney. Oh, look, absolutely. Um, but I think we're fortunate that we've had a number of golfers come to Sydney for the Australian Open and uh, and take it in and enjoy it uh, as a spectator from interstate. And that's uh, look, that's part of the reason state governments invest in tournaments. So um, we've we've had a lot of that, and that's been part of the strength of the tournament. No more questions. Thanks very much, Steve. We appreciate your time and. Um yeah, thanks for coming in. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Let's have a good week.